Hello everyone, welcome back. This is 1-10, signal transmission methods and basic miscellaneous circuits in the combat resistance series. I'm MU222, and as the title suggests, uh, today we will be talking about uh, signal transmission methods uh, and some basic miscellaneous circuits, as well as some specific topics actually. One is on abrogate, the other is on uh, buds. So yeah. Uh, well, without further ado, let's get started. So I will start on with um, some signal transmission methods. Uh, there are three sections. First one is upwards transmission. Second one is sideways transmission. And the third one would be downwards transmission. So for upwards uh, signal transmission, um, there are some simple methods and some very peculiar methods, but I will talk about the advantages as well. So let's move on to one of the most simple ones, which is a dust uh, slab tower. So you should probably know how this works. If you have uh, seen 1-1, um, uh, properties of resonant components 1, or is it 1-2, properties of resonant components 2. But yeah, either way, uh, one of those videos have explained the use of um, transparent blocks. So slabs are transparent blocks, and by doing a zigzag, um, configuration like this, you can allow redstone dust to travel upwards, essentially, in a too wide space, which is actually quite space efficient. So you can see that it can transmit from bottom to top, but then you also see it cannot travel from top to bottom. It's a one-way transmission. So this can be either advantage or disadvantage, essentially. And then this method ha has its disadvantage is that uh, we all know that redstone dust has um, a maximum signal strength of 15. It can only travel up to 15 blocks. So uh, yeah, it is not expandable unless you have some additional circuits, which I will also explain a bit later. But yeah, if you're just relying on a single dust line, you can only travel at maximum um, 15 blocks, essentially. So yeah. Uh, we can proceed to look for more solutions that are more expandable, let's just say. So here we have the second one, which is a slime and resistant block extender. Um, the, the How it works is very simple. I'm sure you all can figure it out. But uh, some notice, some, no, some mentions is that if you have these two configurations, well, this one doesn't work because of quasi connectivity on pistons so it cannot even retract. While this one it technically works. However, it is also a block update detector or bud. I will talk about this later. So you have to be careful if you use this because if you give two updates like this, it will just get spit out. And also this means that you cannot have any um, wiring on the side of this because it would just get detected or you cannot have any block updates that will update it unintentionally. So yeah, you just have to be careful if you're using this in the case. But then if you have two slime blocks and then a resistance block, then it will be fine, basically. So, but then, now the slab tower is instant. That's nice. This is not instant. That's not nice. Well, it's instance for retraction, but not during extension. So what would be a better way to have a more efficient um, transmission, yet with unlimited uh, restriction on the height? Well, here comes the uh, bubble column. Uh, there are a couple of ways that you can manipulate the bubble column to give um, to proceed with signal transmission. So the first one is just literally moving the soul sand or magma block. So by doing this, you can just tra transmit a signal to this piston here. But then when you place the soul sand or magma block back for the uh, bubble column, it actually has a massive delay. So uh, needless to say, this delay is relatively short uh, in the whole scheme of things. However, it is still not efficient enough. So hence, we actually have another method, which is actually to use a dispenser with a bucket. Um, notice that this dispenser is placed one block above the base block. So you just have to do that. Um, you can place any blocks above the base block, but it has to be at least one block. 
All right. So, so you can see I've actually added this circuit right here. It's just to demonstrate the delay. So yeah, this dispenser here actually imposes quite a bit of delay. So one, two, three, four, five. So this is five observers and this is one observer. So you can see it has a five tick of delay or 10 game ticks. Uh, so yeah, it's still not that efficient, but then the concept of water call, uh, sorry, bubble column itself is actually very efficient because um, the delay between any block is literally zero. The only delay imposed is actually the observer. Well, it also depends on what component you're using. If you're using a sticky piston, then on retraction like this here, yeah, then you will have a massive delay. And for the dispenser, it will always be four extra ticks of delay or eight game ticks. So yeah, just some mentions. And let's move on with some more conventional um, examples of uh, signal transmission. Um, Observer line is very simple. Now you can also notice that there are also some differences between the signal transmission methods. This gives a constant signal, this gives a constant signal, this gives a pulse, this gives, gives a pulse, and in this uh, circuit here, this is a slider, uh, this also gives a pulse. Now it has been mentioned in 1-6, uh, basic circuits pulse uh, signal conversion that you can always just convert between a pulse and a constant signal so uh, if you need to do that just do it so yeah I don't think that is a real challenge to be honest so yeah, just refer to that video if you have any uh, need for reference so yeah that is all of the upward signal transmission that I have so now I'll go to sideways signal transmission um, here are the four uh, conventional ones so the first one is the dust line. I'm pretty sure pretty sure everyone can figure that out. Second one would be a resin block extender. It's literally very similar to the slime and resin block extender. You can even add slime actually, but I just didn't bother to add it. And the third one would be observer line similar to this. So it gives a pulse. And the fourth one would be a slider. Now I guess it's also nice to mention that um, you don't have to exactly have this configuration as a slider. You don't have to have this resonant dust that directly powers this piston. In fact, you can have any amount of delay that powers this piston, as long as this piston is getting power and pushing back the entire column of blocks. So yeah, just to mention. And then here we come, it, it, this peculiar method, this is um, a rail line. Um, now, you might ask, why do you need such a more com complex system in order to have signal transmission sideways or horizontally? There is a reason. It is essentially instant, uh, excluding the observer, basically. Uh, so if I power this piston, it actually, excluding the observer, it actually instantly powers the, the rest of the lamp. Now let's just see how this works. I'll just briefly mention it. So if you recall, rails can uh, be powered up to nine blocks, including the origin. I hope I remember it right. Okay, but anyways, so basically you can see this resonant block is responsible for powering up to nine rails essentially. But then you can see after the nine rails, it also powers. Now this is because it the rail doesn't have uh, isn't provided any updates essentially they are how do you say it this resin block is powering all of the rails such that none of the rails realize that they should be turned off let's just say it like that I'm not really good at explaining this one but either way so what happens when you have this piston is that you make this rail realize that it should be off, so it turns off, and for all of the rails that are supposed to turn off, so from this rail starting, going to this direction, all of the rails realize that they should be turned off, and then the observer will detect this being off and then turn them back on, same as this observer here, 
So basically, all of the rails would be turned back on again. And then none of the rails would realize that they should be off, since this resonant block providing a power source to this rail doesn't give any update to this rail, that they should be off. So they just have their on state again. This is essentially like a block update detector even, which I'll explain it later, or just show you some circuits. But yeah, it's essentially a block update detector, but then we use it for signal transmission methods. So yeah, uh, quite useful, let's just say. So that's all for uh, the sideways signal transmission. So I'll go on to the downwards one. Um, here we see a dust staircase. This is like a staircase, except it is using four blocks, but anyway. Uh, you can have this configuration such that the dust line will travel from here to here. Now notice that this is a two-way transmission. So powering from the bottom would also power the top. So yeah, this you can say is an advantage and disadvantage. It just depends on how you use it. But yeah, either way. And then we also have the classic rest and block extenders. They're, they're basically essentially the same as these. So um, nothing too special here, actually. But then here comes another another special one, which is a cobblestone wall pedal. Now, with the help of uh, iron trapdoors here, as an example, you can always have transmit a signal to this resonant lab. Now, notice there are some um, characteristics. Is that when you transmit a signal like this, for example, you can see that there is a shape change in the cobblestone wall. Now, this will actually um, negate any change in here. Essentially, this is an OR gate, if you have seen 1-9. So here, it doesn't even change. And similar to here, it doesn't give a signal as well. So it's like an OR gate. So yeah, just be aware. This is one of its properties. And the good thing about this is that, again, it is basically instant apart from this observer. So any extra amount of cobblestone wall that you add to the height is actually no difference, no delay. So yeah, um, one of the advantages. So you can already see that I've demonstrated some um, transmission methods that are basically instant. Because I think that's the important takeaway. Because you can always figure out these classic um, transmission methods, except either you will need extra delay if you extend them further, or they just have delayed themselves. So finding ways that can add the amount of blocks traveled without adding delay is actually quite useful in some situations. Although you're not going to probably use this in piston doors, it is still worth to learn if you are doing redstone in survival, for example or in practical use, technical use, who knows. So yeah, anyway, so this is the cobblestone uh, pillar. Now we just have two more simple ones, the, the observer line and the slide. They both work. So you can see some transmission methods are essentially universal, while some are not. For example, this cobblestone pillar, it can only go downwards. This, it can only go sideways. Well, it can also go diagonally upwards, but uh, yeah, let's just not consider that and diagonally downwards. And this one, it can only go upwards, essentially. So, yeah. Uh, all of these transmission methods have their upsides and downsides, and it is left for you to decide which one to use them. You can always just see what qualities that you should hold and what qualities you can sacrifice. That's it. So, these are all the transmission methods that I have. So now I'll just go on to the basic miscellaneous circuits. The first one would be an instant repeater. Basically, from this lever to here, it would be instant. Essentially, if uh, neglecting the input bug effect. I'm not going to introduce this in introductory topics. So, um, why is this useful? 
uh, it essentially allows you to extend a dust line infinitely with the help of several of these guys. So now you can power redstone dust in infinite amounts of length just by adding this when the dust signal has gone out. So yeah, it's pretty useful. The next one would be an observer slider that powers pistons like this. So yeah. Now, why do we use sliders? Slider is essentially a very efficient way of transmitting signals because it essentially occupies only a one white space or one high or one length, whatever. Depends thing on which dimension that you're asking. So, being able to transmit signal in just one pillar of blocks is actually very useful, especially in some large but compact piston doors. And yeah, you see this quite a lot in some uh, very advanced piston doors. And one way to compress the volume is the use of some clever transmission methods. For example, this slider here. And sometimes the slider is also responsible for some power rings that require to be in sync, synchronized. And slider helps to do this uh, very efficiently. So yeah, it also can act as a two-state um, thing, similar to a an, an SR latch. So yeah, it just depends on what state it is currently in. So yeah, there are a lot of uses for sliders. I cannot really explain too much on it, but then I can show you just how you can use it. So here, uh, a simple example, if you just want to power off the pistons, then you can just have this observers alternatively, place alternatively, yeah. So the first time it will power these two pistons and the second time it will power these two pistons. Sim Similar for retraction. So, yeah, uh, just try to experiment with yourselves on what you can do with sliders, I guess. Uh, because I cannot possibly tell you every combination of circuits. I can just show you some important ones that you can remember. But yeah, anyways. So, next we will have some double pulse generators. Um, you will see these used quite often when you have, for example, a piston retraction like this. because they allow powering at one block without extending to this block while still being able to power this piston via quasi-connectivity. So that's why this is useful. So similar here, this is also a double pulse generator, except it uses a two-tick uh, with a piston head that is detected by the observer. And also notice that um, these double pulse generators are not uh, just any type of double pulse generators. Because if you, for example, have a resonant lamp with an observer, this is also a double pulse generator, except the frequency is not fast enough for this piston to retract. So this kind of setup is important. That's why I need to introduce it here. So you probably have learned from um, one uh, seven uh, pulse multiple pulse extenders, multiplies, and clocks. Uh, so yeah, you probably have learned some methods of pulse multipliers. And yeah, I think I've also introduced this concept here, but I will just state it here because it's still very useful indeed. But yeah. Okay, so I should move on. Um, that's all for the basic miscellaneous circuits. Now I'll talk about um, one of the circuits that uh, people kind of underestimate. That is the ABBA gate. ABBA gate is not a logic gate, despite its name. It's literally just a circuit. A delay circuit, let's just, let's just say. What is an ABBA gate though? Well, an ABBA gate refers to a circuit that powers A, then B during one edge, and 
uh, powers or d powers b then a during the other edge and the powering can be done by either pulsing or a constant signal so what situations would you use in other gates well these are the two main examples i just have the pistons here with the blocks here just to illustrate so here we see this piston labeled as a this piston labeled as b so how does an ABA gate help here? So if we just pulse A here and then pulse B here, so you see that these two blocks are now in this position. But then if we want to return to the original position, then we need to pulse B and then pulse A. So you can see the use of ABA gates is essential here. Now for this situation, um, it's quite similar except the A and B are kind of reverse. But yeah, anyway, so A and then B. So this block moves from here to here. But then if we want to go back to the original position, then we want to do B, then A, basically. Now, uh, for this setup, you can also do uh, constant signal. This here, and then this here. That makes more, a bit more sense to me. But yeah, anyways. So, yeah. Now, there isn't a, there isn't a good abrogate, let's just say. Quite frankly, even to my level, I haven't done many abrogates as well. Simply because, one, if you develop a sequence, you usually would avoid some abrogates when you can. It's quite a quite a bit complex to construct abrogates sometimes. And uh, yeah, so the first reason is sequencing. Uh, the other reason is because of how uh, abrogates uh, are essentially created. So let me just explain that. So one of the main ways of creating an abrogate is actually a pulse extender on A and, the, and just impose a delay on B. So this circuit demonstrates a good example. So you can see A is powered than B, but then on turning off of this lever, you can see B turns off then A. So yeah, you can see what this circuit is doing is that we power A first, okay? And then after four ticks, we power B. And then we have also here after four ticks, we'll power A again. So what happens here is that we have a delay circuit here. This four tick repeater is a delay circuit on B, while the this part of circuit is a pulse extender on A. So yeah, just remember that for an ABA gate, you want a pulse extender on A and a delay circuit on B. Well, the delay on circuit on B should not be too massive. Otherwise, your pulse extender on A, you would require a very, very long extension of pulse. So yeah, uh, that is one of the concepts of an ABA gate. Now, if you want to pulse A and B, uh, this is kind of ridiculous, but then you just literally have two circuits. So you just have one circuit that pulses A then B, and then you just have the other circuit that pulses B then A. So you would want, for example, if you want A, B during rising edge and B, A during falling edge, then you just have rising edge monostable circuit on A, B, and then have falling edge monostable circuit on B, A. So yeah. That's literally the concept. It's very hard to generalize, as uh, not generalize. It's very hard to specify some useful circuits for abrogate. Literally, you is more reliant on the concepts because each of the use of abrogate is can be quite substantially different. So yeah, that's why I introduce concepts here rather than. Uh, actual circuits. I don't even expect you to copy circuits. I expect you to use the concepts of pulse extenders that you have learned from 1-7 and rising edge, falling edge monostable circuits that you have learned from 1-6 to apply them here to build other gates, literally. So, yeah. And then, the third concept is essentially evading the use of abrogate because in some situations abrogate is not necessary and as i've already said the fact that i didn't use too much abrogate is sometimes due to sequence programming that i can do aba instead of abba 
So here's an example. If we have long power A and then we just pulse B, this can actually be a valid sequence that can replace an upper gate. Why? We can take a look at this example again. If we long power A, then we pulse B, and then like this, it's the same. If we do it once again, it's also the same. The effects are essentially the same in some situations. Of course, it's not in this situation. Because, first off, you cannot long power A. And second off, A, B, A, it literally does a different thing. So in some situations, you can replace an other gate with an ABA sequence. But in other situations like this, you just can't. So, yeah. Uh, let's get on with the examples, I guess. I, have, I don't have much to say about um, the sequencing. So, let's just consider this case now. So, a solution for this would be to have, for example, this extender, rest and block extender that just does this. And then have this. Uh, notice that you do need the uh, updated piston due to um, tight timings, essentially. And then for the ex for this case, you can also have a similar circuit here, except uh, it's built a bit differently this time. So yeah, all of these are arbor gates, essentially, but uh, they are wired. Well quite weird, let's just say. And in addition, it just shows you the concept. So basically, you can always have a resistance block extender that just do A, B, and then you just have this retract, and then it would just automatically do B, A. And now, the another concept would be this, is that you can always move in an observer. Okay, let's just see. Let's just say this is A, this is B. Okay, so what happens when I press this button here? So... We have this observer that gets powered, so A here. And then we have these observers that retract this observer. So the observer would go to here, powers B, all right? Then what happens when the button turns off? This observer will trigger this observer, trigger this, so we have powers B. And then this circuit here pushes the observer back to here, and then this observer powers A. So you can have some sort of like a circuit that will be detected by the observer in these two blocks and then you just move the piston. So this is the concept behind this other gate. So yeah. And um, moreover, uh, you can also have this configuration as well. Uh, no, actually this, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Since arbor gates, you can just invert an arbor gates to do B, A, A, B. So yeah, it's essentially the same. A and B are symmetrical. So yeah. So hopefully you have learned some techniques for building an arbor gate. It's important that you know the techniques actually is copy and pasting other gates is actually not preferred. Although you can always refer to uh, pulse generators or pulse extenders. These, these uh, circuits would be useful and serve as a basis for other gates, essentially. But then learning other gate circuits directly doesn't help you. So, yeah. In fact, learning how to build redstone should be based on that you know the basis of circuits and then you try to create more complex circuits from them. I think that is the best way to learn it, let's just say. And also constant practicing. So yeah, anyway, so I'm rambling. So let's just go on with the last topic, which is block update detectors or buds. They, are, they refer to circuits that can 
the text block or resident updates from the components within the circuit. So uh, we have standard bus here as an example, a slime block with a resident block here. So you can see this here actually quasi uh, powers this here, this piston here, but then there is no block updates until we give it one. So you can see this is a standard bus that gives a pulse to this resident lamp. And now we also have another one, this is a dropper bot. This actually, quite frankly, is taken from a question, uh, episode 3 of Practical Redstone by MD. So uh, this is just a solution to uh, the question one of episode 3. So yeah, you can see this also works. So why does it work? Because this dropper is, it thinks that it's on, when it in fact should be off, because there's nothing powering it. And then, when you give a block update or a resident update, it turns off, all right? These three observers would turn this back on, but then this two tick repeater would quasi power this dropper, since resident lamp is a solid block. So this dropper never realizes that it should be turned off, so it doesn't turn off and until you give it another block update or resident update. So yeah, this is essentially how bots work, literally. Either it is powered, but doesn't realize that it is powered, or it is not powered, and it doesn't realize it is not powered. It still thinks it's powered. So yeah. So these are the standard bots, let's just say. But then there are also some kind of other bots. We call them a T bot because they are basically bots that toggles its states for each block or resident update. So here as an example, if I give it this an update, you can see it turns on this resident lamp constantly. It's a constant signal. And then when I give it another block update again, it just turns back off. So yeah, this is a T bot, a piston T bot. So uh, similar if you use the dropper here, it works basically the same. You just have maybe have some minor changes in the circuits, but yeah, essentially the concept is the same thing. So we have um, this here that will basically redirect this redstone dust, such that redirect or not redirect this redstone dust, such that this piston will act as a T bot again. Like so. So yeah, and then lastly we have this here. This is a comparator bot. Uh, comparator bot is also sometimes called CUD. I'm not going to say its name. It's kind of weird. So basically, if you update this, you just give a pulse here. So you can just take an output from here. Like so. So yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I will just explain a bit more about this one. I kind of rush through this. So basically, if I update this, this does is powering this here, but it doesn't realize it. So it gets powered. This here retracts this resident block. This dust is now redirected, but a piston never actually realized it. It doesn't re actually realize dust redirections. So we just need to update it again to make it turn off. And then the same thing happens. This dust is not re redirected anymore. It actually powers this piston, but the piston again never realizes until we give another block update. So yeah, same thing here. So yeah, uh, that's all for all of the circuits that I would like to introduce to you here. Uh, let's just go on with the exercise. The exercise today is actually quite easy and very few as well, only two questions. So yeah, uh, essentially this here tests you on the ability of using ABBA uh, just for this module here. This here is just um, standard circuitry. You, you can already uh, construct this from the knowledge that you have learned in 1-6 and 1-7, I think. And then this here tests, tests you on the ability of uh, building sliders. And here, this is quite special because you can see there are no, uh, you are not allowed to build in this space. You are only allowed to build in this space. It's literally separated from the rest of the build. So you need to find ways to power this piston when the slider pushes over. So just a hint for you, it's a button. 
So yeah, uh, good luck for the exercise. Uh, should be easy this time, I think. So yeah, uh, thank you for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.